All right. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. What a great scripture, Matthew 28, 18. Uh, what this takes place, this takes place at the uh, a mountain in Galilee where Jesus has basically uh, been resurrected from the dead. Uh, tomb has been rolled, the, the stone before the tomb had been rolled away. Jesus has come forward. He's seen all his disciples and now he told them to meet in Galilee and 500 of them are meeting together. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 28 verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Father, this morning in the time that I have, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak, that you would inspire, that you would illuminate, that your presence would come and convict and change and heal and deliver as I speak your word to your people in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You know, the resurrection is the foundation of our faith. It is the foundation of our faith. It separates us from all the other religions. It separates Jesus from all the other so-called spiritual leaders because for all the other spiritual leaders, death succeeded them. But with Jesus, even death had to bow its knee. With Jesus, even the grave couldn't grab a hold of him. He rose from the grave. And here in this particular scripture, it's just living proof that this man truly was who he said he was. Not only 100% man, but the living son of God. 100% God and 100% man we have in Jesus. And so, yes, he died. Yes, he rose again. And he comes to his disciples with this message that really is, I think, one of the most pivotal messages for the church of today. He gives them a mandate. Matthew ends with this. Mark ends with this. And, and, and uh, most of the, uh, the Gospels refer to this, this mandate because this is the last recorded thing that Jesus said to his disciples. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We need to understand today that when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he wasn't saying, well, I've still got to do this, this, and this before you can have freedom. He says, I have done everything I was called to do. I have done everything that was asked of me by God. I have completed the race. I have sat down. It is finished. And he said, because of that, God the Father has given me all authority. All authority on heaven and earth. I have authority over sickness. I have authority over uh, uh, sin. I have authority over death. I have authority over the bondages and addictions that you may face. I have authority over torment and depression and sickness. And what's more, in the heavenly realm, I have authority over the, the devil and over every demonic force. I have been given all authority on heaven and earth. And see, sometimes we don't realize the power we have in Christ Jesus. We don't, have, we don't have a clear understanding or a revelation of the authority and standing we have in Christ Jesus. And this morning, I'm here to remind you that all authority, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to God. I don't know if you've ever been to a restaurant or a, or a business and, or a, even a government department and, you know, something's gone wrong and the person at the desk says, hey, listen, I don't know. I don't know if we can do this. I don't know. If you do. And then something inside you says, listen, can I speak to your manager, please? Because it's obvious that you don't have any authority. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the highest authority. King of all kings, Lord of all lords. So when you speak to the manager's manager's manager, it comes down to Jesus. So therefore, no matter what your circumstance is, no matter what your situation is, you can always go to a higher source, a higher power, and that is Jesus Christ. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, he says. I have completed my mission, and now, therefore, go. Therefore, go. With all that, 
You need to know that nothing else has to be done by God. I have done everything, therefore having an understanding that all authority has been given to me. With that understanding, now you go. Now you go. It's In this particular passage of Scripture, it's like the Lord has this baton and He has run His race and it is already won. And He says, oh, by the way, can you just take it to the finish line now? Now it's your turn. Now it's the church of Jesus Christ's turn. Now it's my turn. We are here on this earth to finish off the last part of the leg, the last part of the race. Church is so much more than us sitting here, being inspired, having the, the, the love of good friends and good people, hearing the Word of God. That's all wonderful. That's all beautiful. That's part of church. That's what is needed for us to be inspired sometimes and to, to get things right in our own life sometimes. But please, don't leave it at that. You see, it's when you leave this place, that's when you run your race. Your mission field is outside those doors. Your mission field is the place that you go to every week. And you're going, well, I'm a, I'm a housewife. Well, your mission field is your mums and bubs group. Your mission field is your IGA. Your mission field is your workplace, is your university, is your TAFE. When he says go, we are to go into those places that are, are ordinary, those places that we go to all the time. And we are to make disciples out of them. You know, so often the church says, come. But Jesus said, go. The church says, hey, come to this meeting and the pastor will fix you up. Come to this meeting and the worship, it'll bless you. That's all good, but wrong way around. Jesus said, no, 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 go. You go, you go, you go, you go, you go, and influence and transform society. You go and do what I have called you to do. I, I, I love Peter, uh, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, 17. You know, Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, uh, was led up to a high mountain by themselves with Jesus. And there he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes, this is Jesus, became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before him Moses, who was dead for hundreds of years, Elijah, the great prophet, the miracle worker, and they're talking with Jesus. And, and Peter goes, this is awesome. I want to live here. I'm going to stay right here in the glory. Let's build some shelters. Let's forget the other disciples. Let's not go back down the mountain. I don't know what's down there, but I'd rather be here. I'd rather soak and soak and soak until I just pop. I want to be so full of God. But Jesus was smarter than that. Jesus says you need the mountain experiences. You need to soak. You need to know him. He loves the intimacy, but there is a purpose. There is a purpose. You get full to give out. That's how God works. You get touched so that you can touch others. You get healed so that you can heal others. You get delivered so that you can deliver others. So Jesus says, hey, listen, don't say calm. Don't say camp. Let's have another, another, another soca meeting so that we can get on top of the." He says, great, get that. And now let's go down. And you know what? Sometimes we don't want to go down because you know what greeted them at the bottom of that mountain? There was the demonized son. Not fun. Moses, demonized son. Moses, demonized son. Which one would you pick? Oh, yeah, let's not forget the angry dad. I brought this guy to you and you guys could do nothing. Oh, and let's not forget there was the disciples who were discouraged at the bottom of the hill. Let's not forget there was the unbelieving generation. And Jesus says, that's why we had that moment. We had that moment so that we can have this moment. So that you can go. You know, we need to become more intentionalized with our going. You see, we're actually, the going part is easy. We do it every day of our lives. But we don't realize that we are going to make 
We are going to make disciples. And the moment you realize, okay, today I'm going, but I'm not just going to get a bus. I'm not just going to buy the groceries. I'm not just going to university. and test. I'm going to make. I'm going to go to make disciples. Father, give me opportunity today to go and to make disciples. And when we go with that heart, I tell you something breaks off. Something different happens. And we begin to see opportunities when we can go and make disciples. And you're sitting here going, well, Pastor Joel, how do I make disciples? Well, firstly, you need to realize who you're going to. See, the very people you don't want to go to because they're so ungodly. The Ninevites, you know, the ones that hurt you say, go. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Ah, no thanks. I will go anywhere. Jonah was a prophet. He was used to going. He was used to going in Israel and speaking the word of God. But now God has the nerve to send him to the very people that have persecuted him, the very people that have done horrible things to the Israel, the very, and he says, no way, God, I will go to another part, but I will not go to those very people that cause me hurt. I'm here to tell you the people that annoy you the most, the people that uh, uh, push back on you the most, the people that are most anti your faith, Go. Go. They're the ones. I want you to think right now. Who is most anti-Christ person you know? Who is the person that every time you come home full of Jesus and there's this family member that's not saved that goes, really? They're just after your money. Who is that anti-Christ person at work? Man, Sunday was amazing. I had an encounter. Oh, yeah. Here you go, churchy. Who is that person? Think about them. Picture them. Can you see them? That's your Nineveh. That's your mandate. That's the one God saying, go, make a disciple out of them. I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to race through this very, very quickly. How do you make a disciple? You see, people are so different. God's made them so precious and unique, each one. And so there is no formula. Oh, what? What are you teaching us then? Five quick steps on how to make a disciple. Number one, are you ready? Build friendship. Build friendship with Mr. Antichrist, with Mr. Belzebub and Mr. No Faith and Mrs. Cynical over everything spiritual, with Mr. I Doubt a Lot. Build friendship. Build friendship. Just love them. Just love them. Go and make yourself. See, they're pushing you away and the enemy's going, yes, because you're actually listening and saying, great, I'll just stay away from you. But you see, Christ has actually brought you to their path to go into their life and to bring light to darkness and salt to their life. So they're going, no, I don't want it. Everything in them is resisting. And you're going, yeah, good. Well, there you go. I'm not going to go. I'm going to go to someone. But listen, that's the person. Go. Go. Build friendship. Number two, pray. Pray. I don't know how to reach this person. They're driving me crazy. Every time I say this, they do that. Pray because God is the one that gives strategy. God is the one that gives you the key to open the door. Maybe it's an unsaved husband that's driving you crazy and you've been preaching and you've been putting Bibles everywhere around the house. That doesn't work and you hear somebody else or what they did is they got a cloth prayed for and they put it under the pillow. So you got a cloth prayed for and you put it under the pillow and he used it as a handkerchief. You know, whatever, whatever has happened. Listen, stop copying everybody else's way of making disciples. They are unique. God wants to use you in a unique way. Pray. And ask the Lord who, who has authority over everything to give you wisdom and insight onto how to unlock the door of their heart, what to pray to break off their life, what things are holding them back. Begin to pray that way. Number three, do good. Do good. Do good. Jesus went around Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil. Before we can go around preaching the gospel, before we can go around witnessing, I think we need to realize people are skeptical about church. They're skeptical about God. And so therefore we need to show them the love of Christ. Do good. Serve somebody. And your service will be the best witness ever. Number four, very quickly, witness 
and not preach. What does a witness do? I was like this. I was there at this time. I saw this. It happened to me. Full stop. Don't preach. Save your preaching for your saved friends. But just share with them. And some of you just don't preach. Full stop. All your saved friends are going, no, no, they preach all the time. Don't. Listen, just witness. A witness is my life was like this. I read in the Bible this. So I did this. And now this is my life. You know, some of us, we want to stop people from sleeping around. We want to stop people from drinking before they're even saved. Before they, We're more interested in behavior modification than their salvation. So we start to preach to them. Pastor, look, this, this daughter of mine, she's sleeping around. You know what? Let her because she doesn't even know Christ yet. Get her soul saved first. Be a witness. Don't go after behavior modification. Go after, let God go after their heart. Amen? And the last thing is share with them. When you are ready and when they're ready, a God opportunity, share with them the gospel as the musicians come up. Romans 3.23 is the gospel. These four scriptures summarize the gospel beautifully. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, a lot of Christians don't actually know the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So they say, come to church. Oh, yes, you're a Christian. Here's the good news of Jesus, that all of us have sinned, including you, including me. And we've fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages or the consequences of sin is death. Right? But then John 3.16, which you all know, says, for God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. Hey, listen, Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. If you believe in him, you can have everlasting life. That's the gospel. But how? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Come on, just confess it. Just say, God, I've blown it. Today, would you come and forgive me of my sins? And that's what God does. It's powerful. It's so powerful. Church, this week, I want to release you out to be great ministers. I want to speak to each one of you. Go. Go to that one that's driving you crazy. Go to the one that's opposing you and make disciples. For some of you, you might need to go back. Before you preach, you need to go back and do the first things first. Whatever it is, we've got a mandate. This is what Christ said before he left. He gave us that command. That is the mission and the purpose of the church. Would you stand with me?